right? Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. All right. So first of all, uh, thank you for that introduction. It's also a pleasure to, to share this table with you. Um, thanks to Laura for the invitation and my congratulations to the to Laura and the organizing, organizing committee for organizing this event and for all the hard work that you are, you are doing. Uh, my talk here today is entitled Powerful Women and the Music Hall in Immature Fiction. And my analysis of the figure of the actress will be guided by my three research interests, space, gender and the body. I started researching into space and gender in the Victorian era and in Victorian literature when I was doing my thesis uh, with Rosario. Um, and my principal aim was to examine how women challenged uh, the public-private dichotomy and how this was represented through transgressive female figures in New Victorian literature. And this led me to the Victorian world of spectacle and female performers as the circus artist, the freak performer and the musical actress. Uh, at the time, I was working on uh, the earliest novels in this subgenre through the lens of Judith Butler's theory on gender performance, Angela Carter's Night at the Circus, and Sarah Waters' Tipping the Velvet, published in 1998. Uh, and uh, Christina gave a very good paper on, on Nights at the Circus in previous session. Uh, since then, many authors have recurred to the world of spectacle, and I'm going to show you two slides just to give you a brief overview. These are novels, novels published uh, in, in the context of the circus and the freak show, sometimes together. Uh -huh. right. And unfortunately, I don't have time to give you a synopsis, but you can take a photo and look into those novels later. And here's the second slide on the music hall and the actress. Uh, the three novels in the right corner, um, The Girl in a Blue Dress, Becoming Belle and Shadow Play are biofictions on Victorian actresses, but I'm more interested in the musical actress, which would be the rest. Now, I think that it is not noteworthy to mention that of the 27 novels displayed here, 21 have been written by women writers. And in the context of this conference, women staging and restaging in the 19th century, I want to discuss how women writers restate Victorian women as powerful within the context of musical culture, taking the Kitty Peck series as an example. The issues at hand here are three. The musical uh, as a space of female empowerment, the actress as an empowered woman, and third, powerful women in the musical, in the New Victorian musical, with uh, the Piggy, uh, Piggy Kitty Peck series as an example. My presentation has been divided into two parts. First, I will try to dismantle the stereotyped image of the Victorian actress, arguing that the much repeated actress prostitute comparison is an overgeneralization indebted to a middle class concern for respectability. And moreover, I will question its applicability to working, working class culture and try to reorient our perspective of our moral status uh, of the music uh, hall actress. And second, I will move on to the new Victorian context, arguing that uh, the music hall is a space of female empowerment. And I will briefly mention Tipping the Velvet to subsequently focus my attention to the Kitty Peck series. And I will examine Kitty's rise to power and analyze how it changes throughout the four novels in three different phases. So moving on to part one, uh, that the actress would be on equal footings with the prostitute in 19th century is not only a familiar idea, but also a much repeated comparison. Uh, I'm concerned with to what, to what extent this is staged and contested in New Victorian fiction. And it's also an image that is easily accepted for several reasons. I'm just going to mention a few. Uh, the actresses were women working in the public space. Uh, they were women who made non-domestic choices. They were women who made profit from their bodies. And the two professions also shared a space. 
Now, in the volume Actresses as Working Women, Their Social Identity in Victorian Culture, published in 1991, Tracy C. Davis carries out a close examination of the social identity of female performers in Victorian culture, studying both the profession and its condition. Although she acknowledges that the actress was socially stigmatized, she also sustains that the popular association between actresses and prostitutes is patently insufficient. Davis focuses mainly on a middle-class environment and her chapter, The Social Dynamic and Respectability, uh, stresses how the actress struggled to attain a status of professionalism. And I will quote her at length. It's just that uh, the people at home cannot see the PowerPoint because we have not shared the screen. Let's sort it now. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and I have highlighted uh, the most important parts in, in bold, but I'm going to read the, the whole note, uh, the whole quote for you. Uh, actresses enjoyed freedoms unknown to women of other socially sanctioned occupations, but in order to con convince society that they were distinct from the demi monde and to counteract negative judgments about their public existence, they endeavored to make propriety uh, of, their, uh, <clears throat> of their private lives uh, visible and accepted. This was not entirely successful. The conspicuous of the actress at work and at home defiles the bourgeois separation of public and private spheres. The open door policy adopted by some performers was wise in theory, but paradoxical in effect. By providing proof of their respectable normalcy, actresses showed disregard for privacy, modesty, and self-abnegation. Either way, the bourgeoisie disapproved. Davis clearly links prejudice against the actress to Bourgeois' ideology of separate spheres and middle-class sexual mores. Women who turn to the theater to pursue a professional career gain presence and voice in the public sphere. Uh, apart from her non-domestic choice of career, she appropriated a female space within a, do a male-dominated realm. And thus the problem was not only her immoral choice of career. The theater did not merely provide more freedom than other occupations, but it also created opportunities for economic emancipation and empowerment of, uh, for women. Consequently, women working within the theater were perceived as a potential threat to patri patriarchal society. The actress prostitute tandem is rooted in a bourgeois public private dichotomy. And Victorian actresses trans transgressed both spatial and gendered restraints in their pursuit of a pro professional career linked to artistic and personal fulfillment. Juliet Blair coincides with Davies on several points and argues that the actress uh, held a liminal position. She holds that her role as a public woman was traditionally denied the actress of social status within polite society. Uh, and then a little later, he stresses the ethics of the dominant culture to which she was liminally connected. She could, however, invent her own standards and live by her own directives. The actress has thus acquired a certain moral and economic independence. The middle class wanted to establish the position in society through respectability, a trait that would distinguish them from the socioeconomical inferior and less acculturated laboring classes. The fact that Davis and Blair linked the moral judgment of the actress to a bourgeois, middle class, or polite society led me to question if the moral prejudices were applicable to a working class entertainment culture, such as the music hall, and more concretely to the music hall actress. The Victoria Music Hall provided a space of transgression for women who used performance as an expression of independence and self-confidence, argues Dagmar Kift. In the musical actress on transcending femininity, which I published this year, I argue that our understanding of the Victorian actress uh, being considered as a prostitute is grounded in 19th century bourgeois view of femininity and respectability. The middle class moral disregard for the actress has thus eclipsed working class regard for female professional performers on the musical stage. The music hall shifted from being an exclusively working class culture towards becoming a culture conditioned by middle class tastes and interests. 
And I'm not going to talk about it in detail here, but I do want to mention uh, some of the most relevant points uh, in the history of the music hall. So the music hall originated in the 1830s and 40s as a free entertainment, complementary to the song uh, to, to eating and, and socializing in the song and supper rooms. Uh, then it was considered as a vehicle for working class expression and enjoyment. In 1852, Charles Morton's Canterbury Halls was the first hall to be built for this purpose only. Uh, it started to attract uh, larger audiences and the middle classes, they started to, to mingle with the laboring classes in the music halls. Uh, in fact, uh, my, uh, Michael Huggins, he states that young middle class males mixed in relaxed, integrated escapist freedom with working class patrons. Now, uh, these are some marks and after, before and after in the music hall and the middle class involved in musical um, uh, culture is connected both to the audience and to the managing of the halls. Um, the music hall was also under constant attacks by purity groups later in the 1860s onwards, uh, as it was seen as uh, dense of vice and immoral. And this moral anxiety was also anchored in Victorian ideals of respectability associated with the middle class aspirations to distinguish themselves. Um, in the 1880s onwards, there's, there are also various attempts to regulate and to approve popular culture in the metropolis, according to ASL. Uh, and uh, here I want to mention that two um, purity groups in, in, in particular, uh, the Big National Vigilance Associ Association um, and also the London County Council was, was set up to police what was going on in, in the halls, both on stage and in the audience. Now, uh, some notable characteristics of the music hall stage are knowingness, direct address, and appearing in character. Knowingness could be defined as an interlanguage, which enabled the audience to decode the double entendre of the music hall songs and take an active part in the performance displayed on stage. For the music hall actress in particular, these features served as strategies of female empowerment as they could contest and challenge gender roles on stage, especially through humor. And I'm going to show you a clip from the BBC television drama, Miss Mary Lloyd, or Mari, sorry, Miss Mary Lloyd, Queen of the Music Hall, directed by James Hayes. Prepare this, let us hope that it works. Um, and just a, a note on, on the clip, um, Mari will mention cabbages and peas, which is Cockney slang for knees. Sorry, I'm late, gentlemen. Oh, Mrs. Chard, good day to you. Miss Lloyd. How can I be of assistance? As you know, Miss Lloyd, your lyrics are causing a stir. And we have had complaints. Really? I can't think why. Would it be possible for you to tell me which particular lyric is causing offence? I merely aim to entertain, not to offend most of them. Pray tell Mrs Chance. Specifics. Well, what's that a little of what you fancy supposed to be about? Oh, it's always been a belief of mine that a little bit, not too much of what one fancies is a good thing. My dear mother, for example, loves a dandelion and burdock, but I don't advise that I drink it by the gallon. <laughs> Hello, Laudable. Would you please submit your song lyrics? Do you think my dress is just a little bit... People like to see a fine gown on a woman, don't they? Right. Um, there's the question of you... Showing off your... My drawers. In red, white and blue. It was the king's birthday. It was a special occasion. Very patriotic, I'm sure. It won't happen again. 
I hope not. She sits amongst the cabbages and peas. An innocent song about a lady who sits in her vegetable garden. How can it be anything more than innocent? I think you know, Miss Lloyd. So do you suggest that I change the particular vegetable selected? Well, I suppose it must be a wonderful substitute. Yeah. Very well. She sits amongst the cabbages and leeks. Miss Lloyd. What? And there's the nub of it, gentlemen. Perhaps it's in the imagination of the audience and not in the intention of the performer. Thank you, Ms. Lloyd. You'll be informed of the committee's verdict. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm sure you'll pass the right motion. Straight from the country came Miss Morty Brown. Father cured it, but couldn't endure it. That's why the lady's residing in town. Twelve months ago, her mother self felt quite sublime to sit on a fellow's knee who's beating all the grime. If you show her a kiss, she droop her eyes like this. But now she droops them just one at a time. Has a meaning of its own. Every little movement tells a tale. And when she walks in dainty hobbles at the back of her hair, there's a kind of wibble wobble, and she glides like this. And the Johnnies follow in her trail. Cause when she turns her head like so, something's going, don't you know? Every little movement tells a tale. She turns her head like, so oh, something's going, don't you know? Every little movement tells a tale. All right, so there you got an example of the, the music hall and also what uh, an act might, might look like. Um, now, the music hall has proved a fruitful ground to explore gender identities in Victorian fiction, and Sarah Waters has turned uh, to this Victorian performance culture to explore lesbian identity in the past, and also to push a contemporary queer agenda with Tipping the Velvet. This queer bildungsroman is set in London in the 1880s and turns the music hall into a vehicle to explore gender identity through performance. A considerable amount of literature has been published on tipping the velvets and gender space have been largely discussed by critics, so I'm not going to, to, um, to do that in my talk today. today. Uh, but I think that it's still necessary to mention it briefly, uh, as it is a starting point in Victorian musical fiction. So summing up for those of you who are not familiar with the novel, have, have you read the novel Tipping the Velvet? Yeah, well, some, right? So, just summing up for, for those of you who don't know it uh, Nancy Astley is a small town girl who meets a cross dressing touring actress, Kitty Butler. They fall in love, and later, uh, Nancy or Nan will uh, join her in London to become part of the performer, performance as a male impersonator. As the narrative unfolds, Nan journeys through different lesbian subcultures in London, where she explores her sexual identity through performative acts on and off the stage. And the reader follows Nan's fortunes and misfortunes in her different roles as actress, mistress, prostitute, and political activist, until she reaches this lesbian self-emancipation. For Nan, uh, the music hall becomes a space of empowerment where she can explore her gender identity, express her lesbian desire, and hence finds a space for personal fulfillment. And I'm going to show you a very short clip, just one minute from uh, the BBC adaptation, uh, because the lyrics is a neat summary of this journey. And the two women she addresses in the audience are her first love and, and her true love. And the, the clip includes appearing in character, direct address, and the double trend and and knowingness. Oh. 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 
got a girl, she's as pretty as a picture. She's the best pal in the world. She's not the kind who'd let you down. She's the sweetest little lollipop in London town. She's a dear, she's a darling, she's a little bit of heaven. She's a diamond, she's a ruby, she's a pearl. I've had a funny sort of life, with lots of ups and downs. I've worn a lot of different sorts of hats. I've trudged the streets of London, not a penny to my name. Next day, a toff in topper came in spats. I've seen a lot of pretty girls, a lot of plain ones, too. I've felt the prick of naughty Cupid's dart. I've known some girls whose kisses could leave you black and blue. One or two could fairly break your heart. But now I think it's time I settled down and built myself a cosy little nest to share with the sweetest girl in London town. The one that I love best. She's as pretty as a picture. She's the best pal in the world. She's not the kind who'd let you down. She's the sweetest little lollipop in London town. She's a dear, she's a darling. She's a little bit of heaven. She's a diamond, she's a ruby, she's a pearl. Um, so now I'm going to move on to uh, Kate Griffin's series, uh, The Kitty, Mac, uh, Kitty Peck <laughs> Mysteries, which consists of uh, four novels, and it also, the, the fourth novel com completes the, the, the series. Uh, this quartet of crime fiction builds on the entangled world of the London Music Hall, and the plot line that runs through the four novels is hooked on the criminal underworld. The mystery series opens with a murderer on the loose in London East End, targeting women in the music halls. Four girls have gone missing from Lady Ginger's halls, and Kitty Peck gets involved in a detective game of saving the victims and stopping the murderer before he strikes again. Uh, Griffin represents powerful women in an otherwise male-dominated space, and thus turns the novels into something more than female crime fiction. The novels are told in the first person by Kitty Peck and readers follow her entangled journey through the criminal underworld of London as she ascends to a powerful position within the London Music Hall. Kitty's relationship with her brother Joseph is a major conflict in the series and in volume one she is driven by the quest to find her missing brother who everybody believes to be drowned and his death has been staged for protection after getting in trouble with the influential members of the guy underworld of London, which is directly linked to the sphere of the London barons who, who, who are controlling the, the halls, uh, among other things. In the second volume, Kitty inherits a powerful position within the musical from Lady Ginger, an East End Lady Baron, who turns out to be her biological grandmother. Lady Ginger is owner of three music halls, the Gaudi, the Comet, and the Carnival, which are part of her East End em empire, the Paradise, uh, which builds a facade to the criminal activities she manages, such as opium trade. When Kitty takes over from her grandmother, she gets trapped in a power struggle between Lady Ginger and the other barons, and the plot development follows Kitty's emancipation from the barons' control and rise to power and female independence in volumes three and four. And I have divided this into three phases. So the first phase is called uh, Kitty Peck, the Limehouse uh, Linnet, the Songbird. 
Kitty's career as musical actress is surprisingly short, and Griffin does not uh, allow the heroine to explore the subversive and empowering possibilities of the musical to its full potential, unlike Sarah Waters. Fact is, as an actress, Kitty is not a, in a powerful position in the beginning, and she is rather obliged to perform by Lady, Lady Ginger, who threatens her onto stage. And this is a quote from the novel reading, this is not a request, Kitty Peck, it's an order. Like your brother, you are my property and I have made plans for you. I think you should know that if you fail me in this, you will never see your brother alive again. And the plans are that Kitty will play the double role of an aerial performer and spy. Her act as a cage songbird enables her to observe the audience from a privileged position and detect any clue that may lead Lady Ginger to the person who is abducting girls from her halls. Yet we will later discover that this is the starting point in uh, Kitty's empowerment and the skills that Madame Celeste, the most dazzling aerialist in Dublin, uh, has, um, uh, teaches Kitty will turn out to be useful in more than one endangered situation, both on and off the stage. And as Peter Tate affirms, the aerialist possessed the capacity to overcome the known limits of mobility in space. And in this regard, Kitty's skills as an aerial performer will later enable her to dissolve gendered spatial uh, restraints. Now, Kitty becomes the Limehouse Linnet, and Griffin draws on the standard bird imagery of representing the Victorian woman as a caged bird. And indeed, Kitty is entrapped both literally and metaphorically as she's threatened into performing suspended in a bird cage. More, uh, more importantly, Griffin replicates the Victoria musical style of double entendre and knowingness, and Kitty's performance as the Limehouse Linnet is, um, is charged with underlying erotic allure. For practical reasons, her area performance requires a tight-fitting costume showing her legs. And Kitty's song lyrics are aimed at comic effect in in a true musical style. And they remind us of the musical songs that provoke the, out, provoke the outcry of the National Vigilance Associate, Association in the 1890s. As Murray Lloyd audaciously claimed, it is in the imagination of the audience and not the intention of the performer. So rather than reading or singing the song for you, I'm just going to display it. So, in a true musical style, this is of course meant to, to for laughter. And apologies to sensitive members of the audience, but I believe that we've all seen worse. Now, Bram Dijkstra argues that uh, females in aerial work were exposed to sexual inf uh, inferences, and no doubt, middle class men's perception were that performers were uh, a lower class and that they were not only sexual, sexual, sexually available, but were also temptresses. Now, once again, there is a stress on class difference and how middle-class men in particular were attracted to popular actresses and their morals, as their moral standards were supposedly different. Uh, the last two lines, now I'm looking for a gentleman who will do me a good turn, are also an implicit invitation. And Griffin evokes the moral status of the actress when Kitty is ordered to meet men backstage in private. private. Uh, and here she says, um, you need to admit callers to your dressing room. I want you to be a little more friendly with your admirers that are also gentlemen. Nevertheless, the purpose is not to prostitute her or engage her in illicit encounters. Knowing that the murderer is a gentleman and his victims are musical girls, Lady Ginger clarifies for Kitty, you are not just up there to watch, you are a bait. So her moral character is safe as she serves a higher purpose of saving the other girls. And Kitty is only playing her role as a bait. Uh, and she later describes uh, the backstage uh, encounters 
to assure her respectability. There have been several evenings now when I welcomed gentlemen callers. Some of them wanted to part me and I got a deft and I got adept with dealing with them. Some wanted a cozy chat and some of the younger ones who were still wet behind the ears just sat there and got, but none of them made a move against me. Kitty affirms that she is not sexually available, which is also a rejection of the actress-prostitute combination. And Kitty is entangled in a detective game um, and plays on the sexual inendo uh, of her performance on and off the stage only to attract the murderer. However, Kitty does not conform to being a passive bane and her stint as an heiress triggers her journey towards female emp empowerment. And Peter Tate notices how in the 19th century, female uh, aerialists were described as beautiful and adventurous and courageous, traits considerably mainly at the time. Kitty's performative skills, courage and taste for adventure will eventually lead her to the murderer. But to achieve this, she must trespass certain boundaries to gain access to spaces that are exclusively male. When Kitty's best friend, the painter Luca Fratelli, wants to show her The Cinema Girls, an extraordinary painting of nude women only open to male audiences, the solution is to cross-dress. It is not enough to use male disguise to move freely. Kitty has to act as a man and go out noticed in the city. So here Griffin is replicating uh, the strategy of uh, Sarah Waters to make the heroine cross stress to gain access freely to, to urban spaces. This is later reported in a newspaper, London Pictorial News. And I'm I have highlighted just the most important parts. Not content with delighting and alarming her many admirers night after night with a captivating and courageous display, London's favorite aerial artist has stormed a bastion of masculinity. Um, and gaining access to the cinema girls, which is so widely thought to be so stimulating to the artistic sensibility that gentlemen only are permitted access, proving that she is an as audacious in life as in performance. Now, observing this painting, Kitty discovers that the women in it are the missing girls from the halls, a detail that goes undetected by the male viewers for whom the cinema girls is a flesh, flesh show under the pretense of artistic excellence. As Mike Huggins has noticed, middle-class Victorians were resourceful in creating loopholes in the demands of sexual respectability. And this is such an example. The anonymous painter turns out to be the murderer and Kitty's bravery and drive to obtain full recompense from Lady Ginger leads her to dissolve uh, the mystery of the missing girls. Full recompense is much more than Kitty had expected, that is to see her brother again. She's, um, um, sorry, I got lost. Uh, she is informed that her missing brother is alive and uh, safe in a secret place. But she also learns that Lady Ginger is her biological grandmother, who unexpectedly declares that Kitty is heir to her musical empire. And she said, I've tested you, Kitty, and found you worthy. Better than your brother. For a long time, I thought Joseph would be the one, but I was wrong. Your brother has a weakness that can be exploited, and a baron must be strong. You are strong, Kitty. You have proved yourself capable in more ways than you know. So Kitty's skills and courage on and off the stage have proven her worthy of occupying her grandmother's position as a London Baron. Um, she has gained uh, strength and courage training as an aerial performer in Madame Celeste Attic, and these skills will make her powerful uh, at crucial moments throughout the quartets. And there are, it, it's, there are several references to her power, her bodily strength, and her courage. Um, um, but there are interspaces in, in, in the whole quartet, so I haven't uh, included any examples here. Um, by the end of Kitty Peck and the Musical Murders, uh, the heroine's capacity, skills, and potential have been clearly defined and established, and the novel closes with Kitty standing at the crossroad of her life. The choice is yours, Kitty. You can walk uh, away from this room today and live a small, narrow life, 
or you can build your own empire, argues Lady Ginger. Of course, Kitty Shoes is the second option. Nevertheless, she will not reach uh, fulfillment uh, as a powerful and truly independent woman until the portrait is completed. And Kitty has inherited a powerful position from Lady Ginger, but she needs to break free from the influence of her grandmother as well as the control of the barons to gain true power. Sorry. So uh, I'm moving on to the second phase in, uh, in her uh, development, which is the Limehouse uh, Linnet spreads her wings. In the following three volumes, Kitty's rise to power is an entangled journey in which the world of musical, criminal underworld and governments are brought together in the domain of the Brotherhood of the London Barons. Her status as a Lady Baron is unique and her power is entangled in a vast network of powerful and dangerous people that are all men. And I'm going to examine her path to power through the lens of entanglement theory. Well, according to Ian Hodder reads, entanglement theory is different because it's focus on dependency, including dependency between material things, leads to a notion of being caught up or entrapped, a cog, a strand, an addict, the Prometheus bound, Rather than simply identifying links in a network, entanglement theory calls for us to pay attention to the complex relations of dependence and entrapment that comprise those links. Now, Kitty is indeed entrapped in a network of complex relations in which many people depend on her success as a music hall manager and power as a baron. Her path to power is uneven and she must overcome several obstacles in the process of assuming a powerful position and discover who she truly wants to become. While she has proved herself capable of Lady Ginger in volume one, she is put to the test before she can officially uh, be accepted as new baron among uh, the male uh, barons. Uh, although Lady Ginger has retired, she supervises Kitty's um, transition from actress to music hall manager, East End Magnet and London Baron. And Hodder states that entanglements involve multiple threads making contact at multiple points. And Kitty soon realizes that the music hall is one of the nodes in the complex business work network of the paradise. You name it, however low you want to go, flesh houses catering for every appetite, Opium pits, gambling rinks, dog fights, cock fights, even rat fights in the meanest quarters. From the books, she appeared to have a dozen customs, custom men's tied to every finger. And there was respectable stuff too. Ships, warehouses, stocks, bonds, and, and a bit of a bank. Kitty is expected to follow the steps of Lady Ginger to become a baron. Her name, Lin, um, La uh, Lady Ginger, um, uh, it's also uh, a hint at her connection to the Southeast uh, East Asian trade. Uh, and there are visible signs of her opium addiction, such as her black lips, tart fingers, and opium pipe. That also uh, ties her to, to the opium import. Now, um, Griffin uses the metaphor of cleaning the office to portray Kitty's wish to run a clean business. And she says... I want to clean and air the rooms that were coated with a sticky brown layer of Lady Ginger's opium smoke. I needed to clean my, my grandmother's shadow out of the palace before I could live there. I needed to make sure every trace of her was gone. Now, interestingly, Hodder uh, uses, uh, uses uh, the opium trade to explain entanglement theory. And he argues that the sad story of opium shows how many depend, you show how human dependence on things for positive gain can also produce destructive reliance. The web of positive dependence and negative dependency around opium has brought addiction, warts, imprisonment, crime, and terrorism. So uh, in the novels, the barons epitomize this terrorism as they rule the city of London and beyond. And the moment before Kitty will be tested by the barons, Lady Ginger makes her realize the magnitude of their power and the new status that she will acquire. Have you ever wondered how paradise found its name? It's the land of plenty, 
a land of spices, silks, jewels, exotic creatures and bestial, of bestial and humankind. We are fallen, but the wonders and riches of the world are crammed into the warehouses that huddle beside the Thames. Tonight you will meet the men who run the city, and by extension, the men who rule the empire. It is your strength and your weakness. Remember that always. So knowing that Kitty's intention is to clean up the paradise and eradicate the criminal activities, Lin uh, Lady Ginger warns her and encourages her to follow her, her path. Take me as your pattern, pattern, Catherine. You cannot be their friend. Paradise is more than three theaters. They are merely a facade. Surely you know that by now. You have responsibility that weight heavier. You might dream of running paradise in a new way. I dare say you could call it a fair way, but it is not possible. Not now, not while the barons are circling. Now the second volume uh, concludes with Kitty being accepted as a new member of the Baron's Brotherhood after passing their trial. And to be accepted as a Baron, you must commit a crime with the rest of the Barons witnessing it. And in the case of Kitty, she has asked to kill one of the workers in a house who had committed 20 minutes. Um, so um, in the case of Kitty, she is asked to kill one of the workers in her house who has accumulated uh, adepts through gambling, which is um, uh, a sense to 20,000 pounds. And she buries him alive in a wall. And this is, of course, something that will haunt her throughout uh, the rest of the series. So haunted by the guilt of her crime, Kitty, now Lady Linnet, seeks, to, uh, seeks relief in opium and is very close to get entangled in the same network of dependency as Lady Ginger. Now, uh, importantly, her newly acquired power is limiting rather than emancipating, and using Hodder's description, it is a disabling dependency that with opium can lead uh, to dysfunction and entrapment in a downward spiral, spiral of imprisonment and crime. And although uh, Lady Ginger was accepted as Lady Baron, she was controlled by the rest through her opium addiction. Um, now, um, again, I'm quoting Hodder, who says that his description of the entanglement um, relationship of the opium tribe fits the Baron's network of power to perfection. And I'm reading the quote. Overall, the story of the poppy is again one in which human dependence on things leads to a long and gradual realization and manipulation of affordances and greater entanglements so that more is caught up and snared in the change of conditions and consequences. And there is no room for female power within the sphere of the barons. The network of power is a network of dependence in which female power is entangled in conditions and addiction. So far, Lady Linnet has followed Lady Ginger's path, but manages to overcome her opium addiction, and as a result, break the pattern. To be a baron, Kitty is expected to play by the rules and behave as them. However, she turns the focus to the halls and works hard to run a fair and clean business. In Kitty's words, Lady Ginger had called them a front, a painted facade, but to me, they were the heart of it all. When the barons find it difficult to control her, nude paintings depicting Kitty in a pornographic style start to appear all over London and in her halls. When the barons can control her through opium or threat, they try to underscore her power by smearing her reputation. Together with the people who work in the halls, the attempt to reduce her power status is neutralized and Kitty manages to break free from the Brotherhood. In the last volume of the Kitty Pick series, our heroine becomes full -time, uh, a full-time musical proprietor. According to Carrie Powell's work on women and Victorian theater, the theater provides a unique space and opportunity to experience a sense of power and independence for women in the 19th century. And to assert female power, she must emancipate herself from the barons. At a personal level, she is facing revenge uh, from the barons, but luckily for her, Lord Kite's uh, ambition 
will be the end uh, of the rest. The brotherhood of uh, the barons is destroyed from within when Lord Kite has uh, them murdered. And his ambitions are clear and ranks higher than the Baron's London domain, under the pretext that the Barons have no place in our modern world, modern times call for modern solutions. Lord Kite sets up a new order, highly placed, respectable, wealthy and powerful men to form the London Imperial Agency. And we'll later learn that uh, from a parliamentary spy who has been spying on Lord Kai to determine whether he is a potential candidate, that the London Imperial Agency will be an office of the government working hand in glove with the foreign office. Eventually, it will employ hundreds of people, thousands perhaps, and it's fully established. It is intended to be a commercial network of those who in, in, whose interest, financial, legal, marital, administrative, even ancestral, give access to the furthest corner of the empire. The agency will become a mechanism through which the affairs of distinction nations can be manipulated. So in other words, as a member of the imperial agency, the government will sanction rather than censor vile and vicious acts as long as they lie in the interest of the British empire. Now, meanwhile, Kitty's halls are under attack on two fronts. On the one hand by Lord Kite, who is trying to take the halls from her, seeding them with fear and doubt. And on the other hand, the children of purity who declares war on the halls to suffocate lewdness and vice. And I mentioned before, music halls were under attack of purity groups that were concerned with moral health and respectability in the 1880s and 90s. Um, and Mike Huggins, he, he argues in Vice and the Victorians that the music halls were and the variety theater, they were considered specific locations of Vice. Now, Kitty, she faces the children of purity under the leadership of Reverend Ashland Don. And here we have an example of an, an announcement bill. I'm not going to read it, I'm just going to show it. Uh, and the last, uh, the, the last volume is, there are several notices like this, where you can see that clearly that they are declaring war against the musical. And there is a stress on words as um, uh, filth, uh, profanity, purity, corruption, chaos, etc. Now, as the plot evolves, the tone becomes more menacing and warlike as the children of purity declares war on our halls. And it turns out that it's led by men that are closer to her than she has expected. One uh, turns out to be a former musical em employed who wants to take revenge for being expulsed from the musicals when he... Um, when he has committed crime, um, taking advantage of women during his mesmerist acts. And the other one is her, her brother, Joseph, who is wants to take revenge as uh, Kitty stole his birthright to become a baron. Now, Kitty manages to reduce the threats and comes out on top as a proprietor of the three London musicals. All mysteries have been solved and there are no family secrets anymore. The story comes full circle when Kitty returns to the stage as an aerial performer and taking cue from Jackson, who affirms that the music hall could potentially provide a form of emancipation for, fem for female artists. Kitty has become a powerful woman, disen disentangled from male power and the control of the male barons. Joe Robinson's description of the Victorian uh, actress manager neatly sums up Kitty's qualities as a powerful woman in the musical. And she argues, an actress to take on management was that in doing it was in so doing, she might achieve greater control of her artistic development. But there were all other factors as well. No least a desire to achieve commercial success and ambition, which was of course shared with male managers but which has e had even greater importance to women as a means of obtaining some degree of financial independence. 
So this said, Kitty reaches female fulfillment as a financially independent woman who manages three halls and controls her artistic development. So after reading the, the four novels, my conclusions are female power is triggered on stage where the actress acquires skills, courage, strength, and audacity, which are transferred off stage. Sexual inendu is used as a strategy to entertain, appealing to mixed audiences who appreciate humor and the titillating uh, spectacle and admire her talent. Kitty turns a social stigma, stigma into a weapon. The actress morality is only questioned by male middle-class men and works as a mirror uh, of gentlemen's erotic fantasies. The barons possess power that is entangled in a male dominated power structure of dependency. It is a network of extortion, corruption, and criminality. Women's access to male ruling elite is only sanctioned while their power remain entangled in male power networks and can be manipulated and controlled through dependency, being opium or something else. Female uh, financial dependency and power is a threat to male power and hierarchy. And men use morality as a weapon to underscore female power. The men are influential and respect the members of society, gentlemen by class, not by manners, or men who want to ascend to powerful positions. So artistic and per 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 personal fulfillment, financial independence are what make, um, make her powerful. And the influence is um, disentangled from male networks of power. Her respectability and moral character used, is used as a strategy to underscore this, uh, the power of women. Um, that's it, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn, for this wonderful talk. And we've got some time for a couple of questions. Are there any questions, comments? Well, I've got a couple of them, but please, uh, just louder, go ahead, please, go ahead. Thank you. I haven't seen you in one. And I have seen you in one. Yes. Thank you very much, Lynn, for such a wonderful talk. And um, I was wondering if you could um, give us a little bit more of information of, or perhaps your idea on, on a topic which I was thinking about or we were thinking about when we were uh, setting up this conference. And it is also related with a previous panel that we had and it is this idea of a presence of the um, of the entertainment industry in the new Victorian novel. Uh, the people in the room who know more, much more than I do and experts on on new Victorianism, both on stage and in the novel, and in the history of nineteenth century theatre. But um, it is uh, maybe my view that um, there is this tendency for rewriting the entertainment industry of the 19th century by the liminal or the not so well-known uh, history of the entertainment industry in the new Victorian novel. And I was wondering if uh, there is a particular voice of women writers in this uh, rewriting or revisioning of the industry of the 19th century. Because we're going to listen to um, Beth speaking about Mary Sickles. So um, there are hidden histories of the life of the of the lives of the 19th century, which we can see on the contemporary stages nowadays. But um, and we also have got um, restagings or more, let's say, commercial and traditional plays. But it um, it is my view that perhaps the hidden history of the 19th century industry entertainment at present is living in the novel. 
and I'm just thinking out loud because I know that the, uh, I'm just learning at this conference. So there are many people in the room who know much more about this than I do. So uh, I just wanted to know your opinion about that linked to uh, the panel that we had uh, before. Thank you. Um, thank you for, for your question. Let me see if I can move back. Um, All right, well, um, uh, thank you for your question. Um, well, as I mentioned previously, of the, the 27 novels displayed here, 21 uh, are written by, by women writers, and there is a trend uh, in this sub-branch of the, the neo-Victorian world of spectacle to put uh, female performers in focus, especially in popular entertainment. Um, now, I believe that um, there is also a difference between male and female writers, because at, uh, up to the moment, if you, if you compare, for instance, uh, Peter Ackroyd's uh, Dan Leno and the Limehouse Go uh, Golem, uh, it's a more, it's, it's a darker uh, novel, it's a, it's a gothic novel, uh, and he also explores the idea of gender identity, but not as in in a, in a subversive way as, as Sarah Waters. Um, and uh, actually, it was neo Victorian literature that led me into reading more about the Vic Victorian stage. So um, I'm, I'm I'm grateful for for that because it was Rosaria who introduced me to to the topic and, and to Sarah Waters years ago. Um, so yeah, the, and the, the, this idea of the hidden histories, um, of course, uh, we have always been talking about New Victorianism as revoicing silenced voices and minorities, which has almost become a cliche within New Victorianism. So yes, definitely, they are, they are shedding light on, on, on previously um, 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 ignored uh, actresses and uh, it's still on my, I haven't uh, studied them yet but the, the three novels uh, they, are, they focus on Ellen, uh, Ellen Terry um, and uh, so th there, there is uh, uh, an interest in the, in the Victorian actress in general I think we we run out of time Laura it's because look, do we have time for for the question? Because we we should we should be now uh, moving into the next uh, session, so no time for questions. Perhaps a couple of minutes break to and a big round of applause to so Lee for this wonderful, exciting.